So Dr. Khan is a physician, a policy researcher, and an educator, and an author who discusses the concept of the One Health Initiative, of which he is one of the original co-founders. For almost 20 years, Dr. Khan was a research scholar at Princeton University. In 2006, she published Confronting Zoonoses, so she was well ahead of her time, linking human and veteran, veterinary medicine in the, C, in the CDC journal Emerging Infectious Diseases. And that helped launch the One Health Initiative, which is a global effort to promote the One Health concept that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. Dr. Khan has a long list of achievements, but in 2000, and I'm not gonna list them all, but in 2014, she received the Presidential Award for Meritorious um, Service from the American Association of Public Health Physicians. And in 2016, the American Veterinary Epidemiology Society awarded her the highest honor for her work in, the one, in one Health. And it's called the K.F. Meyer James H. Steele Gold Head Cane Award. So um, we are so very lucky to have you here, Dr. Khan. We're thrilled. And I'm going to turn it over to you. And at the end, we'll have uh, some time for questions, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. And I'm truly delighted to, uh, to speak with all of you today. And thank you so much for your interest in, in One Health. So uh, today I'm going to talk with you, giving you a One Health perspective on agriculture, food security, and climate change. And I think it's important that we all recognize that um, agriculture is the foundation of civilization and climate change threatens agriculture and food security. Agriculture provided the food security that allowed towns, villages, nations to develop. So all that we take for granted is really a result of agriculture. And uh, food security, or also known as uh, hunger prevention or zero hunger is so important that the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals listed, lists it as number two uh, in the goals uh, for achieving sustainability. And there are political implications if you don't have food security, if food becomes uh, unavailable, uh, too expensive, um, people start to riot and civil society starts to break down. So it's extremely important. And um, you know, governments have an incentive to ensure food security to then minimize civil unrest or possibly even revolution. And the question we must all ask is, well, how can we feed everybody without destroying the sum of the planet's biosphere? So that's kind of where One Health is. And it started out addressing zoonotic diseases such as SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. And the concept very simply is that human, animal, plant, environmental, and ecosystem health are linked. And that might seem simple and straightforward, but that's generally not what we do, how we approach health and well-being. And for me, I uh, use this concept then as a framework for examining complex issues such as food security and climate change. And I think we need to examine the root causes of health threats if we're to develop effective policies to address them. And I think it's very important to recognize, and I think this pandemic has hit home, that we interact with our environment every day by inhaling air, whether it's outdoor or indoor, drinking water, and ingesting the plants and animals that we call food. Um, this is the One Health Initiative website that my colleagues and I run. It's a labor of love, and uh, please visit it and tell all your uh, friends and colleagues to visit it as well. So One Health, the concept has been visualized in many different ways. You've got intersecting circles with communication and coordination and collaboration. Uh, you've got these intersecting circles with human animals and environments with One Health in the middle. You've got the animal focused animal health and wildlife health with humans interacting. Uh, you've got the umbrella visualization with a whole variety of things under the umbrella. Uh, my contribution were, was these three little green bubbles. 
you've got the intersecting zoonotic infections with the chronic diseases, um, recognizing that animals and humans share physiology and anatomy in many conditions, situations, as well as uh, many diseases. Um, you know, animals get cancer, heart disease, and all the diseases that we do. Uh, my focus, however, is on the zoonotic infection side, and that's where I usually spend my time talking. But I visualize One Health as a matrix. For me, that's my conceptual framework, kind of like a Rubik's cube. Uh, and on one, uh, one dimension, you've got the One Health factors, the humans, animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems. There's the complexity factor that provides scale at the microbial cellular, individual, and population. And then you've got the political, social, and economic factors along the other dimension, and that can be represented by political borders at the local, regional, national, and international global. So if we then push that three dimensions into two dimensions, um, you can see that they all can intersect. And then you can use these boxes then to explore each one. And some might be filled, some might not, depending on the issue that you're uh, you know, investigating, but nevertheless, it provides a very useful framework for examining these issues. And I would just say that um, I define environments as the abiotic aspects of a defined geographic area, the soil, the water, the air, and the ecosystems as the biotic interactions, the microbial, the flora, and the fauna within defined geographic areas. So that's, again, how I approach these things. And uh, I derived that in this paper developing a One Health approach by using a multi-dimensional matrix for anybody who's interested, that's free and online. So let's move forward then with our One Health analysis of uh, food security and uh, climate change. Um, these are the two boxes that I'm going to talk about in this talk. And in other words, I'm going to use a satellite perspective, if you will, talking about it. So let's move now to our Dr. first- Dr. Claus? Um, yeah. Dr. Claus, I'm Con. Um, I wondered if, I know you're having, tr you can't uh, advance your slides um, mm -hmm. unless it's in this mode, but could you, on the bottom right, you can actually zoom so that the slide itself is larger. Do you see that? Oh, sure. The that yeah. might help people see things a little bit better. That, is that better? It's starting to it cuts off. Go on. off the, yeah. yeah. How's, okay. how's that? Is that better? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's I th yeah, that is better. better. Yeah, it is. Good. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. No problem. Thank you for pointing that out. So um, at the global scale, then, we've got almost 8 billion humans in 2022. Uh, we have around, according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, around 30 billion terrestrial food animals. And uh, as the famous book author Taro Gomi writes, all animals eat, so everyone poops. And um, we produce around 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter each year. That's collectively all humans and all domesticated animals. Uh, this was published in Nature uh, Sustainability back in 2018. Very important article that just didn't get the attention it deserved. But if you, um, if you visualize all of this fecal matter, well, it would fill around 1.6 million Olympic-sized swimming pools each year, uh, or to put it another way, completely cover the surface area of Los Angeles and New York and around six feet of feces. And we're producing increasing amounts each year. Um, concentrated animal feeding operations um, uh, produce, uh, raise, uh, thousands of animals together in uh, enclosed areas. And um, there isn't a whole lot of oversight of them as far as I can tell. Uh, and in 2008, the US GAO published this report saying that no federal agency collects consistent reliable data on CAFOs, but some large operations can produce more than 1.6 million tons of manure per year, uh, equal to um, some medium-sized cities. 
and and um, and that has important implications in terms of uh, climate change. Now we produce all this manure, and back in 1961, we used manure as fertilizer. Um, but because of the green revolution and uh, intensive agriculture, uh, the reliance on synthetic high nitrogen fertilizer has increased. We now use globally four times more synthetic fertilizer than manure. And the question is, well, what's being done with all this manure if everybody's using synthetic fertilizer? Um, and um, so that has important implications on food safety because there's a lot of crop contamination, uh, the soil, the water, and um, even uh, the release of gases, which I'll talk about in a few slides. So uh, let's change gears now and talk about climate change and how this all interacts with, with the manure that I was talking about. Climate change threatens agriculture and agriculture, unfortunately, worsens climate change. And to truly understand climate change, you have to look at the geologic timeline of the temperature of the planet. Uh, you have to think like a geologist because this is on grand scales. And in the Paleozoic era, yes, the planet was very hot, but the land was barren and the life was in the seas. And with time, the planet began to cool. Uh, and then you get to the Pliocene and the Pleistocene area. You get to the Ice Age. And the planet was very cold, covered with thick sheets of ice. Uh, and then inexplicably, we don't really know why, the planet began to warm about 10,000 years ago. And it's no surprise that um, for the past 10,000 years, we've had agriculture. And if you look at the timeline of the temperature of the planet, well, the timeline shows us that the planet's climate has been remarkably stable on this Holocene baseline. So the, the, we've had agriculture because the climate has allowed it. And whenever you deviate off this, uh, off this baseline, such as during the little ice age, bad things happen to agriculture and to civilization. And I'll show you in a, the next slide. So this was just a tiny blip below the Holocene baseline by about two degrees uh, Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius or so. We've now gone up about one degree Celsius above this baseline and we are feeling the impact of a changing climate because we've gone off this baseline. So climate change means change off this Holocene baseline that has allowed us to have agriculture and civilization. And I can't stress how important that is uh, as we continue forward. So uh, the artists at the time during the Little Ice Age documented for us what it actually looked like. And the Thames froze over and they would have fairs on the Thames for a couple of hundred years. You see a frozen wasteland in Flanders, ice skating on Rotterdam. But most importantly, the Ice Age was noted for crop failures, bread riots, famine, and wars, uh, documented in this book by Jeffrey Parker, Global Crisis, and Philippe Blom's book, Nature's Mutiny. Uh, very interesting, in this book, he found a correlation between bad weather crop failure, famine, and witch burning, because somebody had to be blamed for the divine punishment of bad weather. Uh, and it was usually poor elderly women who were accused of cavorting with the devil and then burned at the stake. So, uh, you know, scapegoats abound uh, and don't think that, you know, we've changed all that much in the modern era from finding scapegoats for our, for our current ills. Now, the World Bank back in 2010 did some climate modeling to estimate agricultural yields in 2050 due to climate change. Now, 2050 is only about you know, 30 years away, assuming current agricultural practices and crop varieties continue. Uh, and you see that much of the planet becomes too hot and too dry to grow food, uh, with the exception of Canada and the uh, Eurasian North assuming that the soil is fertile. It's not clear if the Arctic permafrost is actually um, you know, arable. 
Um, nevertheless, uh, we have a lot of world hunger already in 2020. Lots of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, parts of South America. And we're already seeing the impact of climate change. And while the US is a, a, a blue here, we certainly have our share of hungry people. So, um, you know, there are parts of the country where there's rampant food insecurity, and that's a serious problem. So if we look at the global land use for food production, most of the surface is ocean, about 29% is land, 71% of this is habitable. And uh, we use about 50% for agriculture, of which 77% of this is used for livestock, 23% for crops. Um, and the crops um, are used to um, the, or the crops in terms of global uh, calorie supply, the livestock produce about 80% and uh, the crops pr provide about 83% of the global calorie supply for people. Our protein supply, 37% from meat and dairy, 63% from plants. Um, and we are continuing to uh, cut down forests for expanding agriculture. And when we do that, we also emit greenhouse gases and particularly in the Amazon and regions of um, Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, if we look at the greenhouse gases specifically, um, carbon dioxide, uh, which is the greenhouse gas that we most talk about, uh, it's the largest uh, gas that we are emitting. That lasts in the atmosphere about a thousand years. Nitrous oxide and methane, nitrous oxide lasts a hundred years, methane 10 years. Carbon dioxide is not the most potent greenhouse gas. That is methane, which is about 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And nitrous oxide, which is 265 times more potent than nitrous uh, than uh, carbon dioxide. So methane and nitrous oxide are two extremely potent but more short-lived greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. So if we can curtail these, we can really get a big bang for our buck by doing that. So um, unfortunately, agriculture is a big emitter of methane and nitrous oxide, as I'll show you in these next slides. So if you look at US greenhouse gas emissions in 2019, we produce about 17% total methane and nitrous oxide. And agriculture is, is a about 10% of our total. If you look at all the different sectors, agriculture produces 10% of the greenhouse gases, but it's a major emitter of both methane and nitrous oxide that you can see in this, these slides. So methane emissions, you've got manure management, uh, 9%. Enteric fermentation, a whopping 27%. And then nitrous oxide, which is 265 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Agricultural soil management, a whopping 78%. Manure management, 4%. So what does all that mean? Well, so enteric fermentation is a big emitter of methane, manure management, and I apologize for the, for the blurriness of this. Uh, manure management emits both methane and nitrous oxide, and then uh, soil management produces whopping amounts of nitrous oxide. Now you might be asking, well, what is enteric fermentation? And uh, Ruminants such as cattle and buffalo have four chambered stomachs, one of which is called a rumen. And the rumen is right here. This is the rumen. And it's kind of a fermenting, you know, they kind of ferment, the, uh, the feed stuff ferments in there, um, producing methane. And then the cows burp and they burp out the methane. And since we have a lot of cattle, uh, they burp out a lot of methane. Some of the different types of digestive systems of, uh, of our animals, uh, the ruminants are again, the, uh, the animals of most concern in terms of enteric fermentation production. And in terms of looking at specifically 
beef cattle, um, you're looking at total gigaton carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, they're producing about 1.8. Dairy cattle, one. Buffaloes, uh, about 0 0.5. And then less so, the uh, pigs, um, the sheep actually are also ruminants and they're also producing a lot of enteric methane as are goats, uh, chickens, not at all. So uh, let's now move to our second One Health analysis, the political, social, and economic factors on these issues. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, where are the biggest meat consumers? Well, uh, the United States is one of the top uh, meat uh, consumers in the world. Uh, and uh, there are pros and cons to eating meat. Um, it provides important micronutrients such as vitamin B12. Some have argued that we've evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat, and eating meat's an integral part of many religions and cultures and societies. However, on the other hand, meat's not essential if we supplement our diet. It increases zoonotic spillover risks, particularly if you're uh, eating um, uh, bush meat or wild animals. Uh, raising domesticated animals, uh, as we've seen previously, contaminates environments, ecosystems uh, with all of that manure uh, and reduces biodiversity when you have to chop down forests to make room for the uh, livestock. Uh, unfortunately, our demand, uh, you know, as our numbers increase, our demand for uh, these products is increasing and global meat production is skyrocketing. Um, and eating meat is the norm almost everywhere. Uh, the only exception is India. Um, around 43% are meat eat meat. Um, they have the largest fraction of vegetarians in the world. And that's largely because of Hinduism. But even in India, their consumption of uh, animal products, dairy products, buffalo, their big producer of buffalo milk and buffalo dairy products uh, is increasing. Uh, but changing national dietary preferences is possible, but it requires cultural and societal change. More Americans are cutting back on meat consumption. Reasons for that include health concerns and environmental concerns. Uh, but again, it's, it's a big challenge. So um, not an easy thing to do, but you know, to reduce demand would, would reduce uh, production. So then a brief recap on our analysis. Um, Agriculture and food security are vulnerable to climate change and climate change is the deviation off the Holocene baseline. Uh, we rely on agriculture and food security for civilization. Uh, unfortunately, agriculture is a major source of methane and nitrous oxide, which are potent greenhouse gases. So we gotta find a, a good balance here. Uh, we produce 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter, which is not clear what we're doing with it because um, sanitation systems process human manure or human fecal matter, not animal fecal matter. So what's happening with all of this fecal matter that's being produced? If it's not being used as fertilizer, uh, there's a preference for synthetic, high nitrogen synthetic fertilizers. Enteric fermentation in, from ruminants is a major source of methane, potent greenhouse gas, and manure and soil management uh, emit major amounts of nitrous oxide and methane. Global demand for meat and other animal proteins is increasing. Changing food preferences is challenging but possible. So, so what can we do then uh, together? on these issues. There, again, there is mitigation potential, reduce the production and consumption of ruminant derived foods. Um, there are strategies to reduce methane and nitrous oxide. Manure management is to change the way manure is stored. There are methane digesters that capture methane and convert it into renewable energy. In terms of agricultural soil management, you want to use low nitrogen fertilizer to avoid the overfertilization of soils. There's drip irrigation, no-till farming where you don't turn over the soil, where you release 
these gases. Um, unfortunately, the Paris Climate Agreement did not address agriculture's emissions. Uh, COP23 um, developed this Coronivia roadmap that looked at how uh, climate change could affect agriculture, less so its focus on reducing agricultural's greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, nothing really substantial happened at COP26 in Glasgow last fall. Uh, the Coronivia joint work on agriculture, um, unable to reach a decision in Glasgow, they're going to debate in their next intersection. So they're just kind of dithering right now on what to do. They recognize the problem, but really nothing on a global scale is being done. Uh, here in the United States, California was the first state to pass the short-lived climate pollutant reduction strategies in 2014. Uh, Democrat Ricardo Lara spearheaded it, and it allocated 12 million to support dairy methane reduction projects to capture methane from manure to use as energy source. I recently learned that New York State passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in July 2019, and it did have measures to achieve long-term carbon sequestration and promote best management practices in land use, agriculture, and forestry. That's really the only thing I could find in this bill uh, specific to agriculture, but it doesn't really specify much. The US Congress uh, introduced a Senate Bill 1337, Agricultural Resilience Act of 2021. Again, uh, a goal to uh, reduce 50% re uh, to achieve 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but this uh, didn't really go anywhere as far as I can tell. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, so to conclude then, low nitrogen fertilizers and no-till farming are methodologies to reduce nitrous oxide emissions in crop agriculture. You want to address the methane emit emissions in uh, cattle and dairy production through manure methane digesters, cap and trade to compensate farmers for their efforts. In the US, at least two states, California and New York have passed greenhouse gas reduction legislation that includes agriculture. I don't know if any other states have, I haven't been able to find that. It would be important to find out. At the federal level, a, a bill was introduced to reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. And at the international level, they've begun to recognize it, but they have a long way to go to actually address it. Uh, again, uh, if we can address it, it would be a big bang for our buck because methane and nitrous oxide are so potent and, and are relatively short lived. So we could actually achieve quite a bit. So we have to figure out a way how to feed ourselves sustainably to maintain civilization on a hotter, drier planet. What can all of you do? Well, learn about One Health, help spread the word. We need to recognize that our effort to benefit animals, plants, environments, and ecosystems benefit ourselves, in this One Health concept. We wanna reduce our waste emissions in the atmosphere as well as the soil and water to improve global health reach out to your colleagues, public education and outreach, and contact your policymakers and urge them to address these issues and vote. So um, I have a free online um, Coursera course called Bad Stucks and Pandemics and Introduction to One Health Policy. I've got over 6,000 students already enrolled from around the world. So uh, please feel free to check it out and uh, enroll. It, it focuses more on zoonotic diseases, uh, it does uh, include food safety, security, and climate change. So with that, I'd like to um, thank my, uh, recognize my colleagues in the One Health Initiative. Uh, again, visit our website. And I wanna thank you all for your time and attention and look forward to your questions. So with that, I will stop sharing my slides. Thank you. I'm chuckling over your, your comment. 
Um, we are so honored that you're here considering, especially that you have a Coursera course that has 6,000 people on it. And here we are getting the opportunity to hear about this concept, which I think is really a, you know, a brilliant concept, the, the intersection of, of health and, and the environment and agriculture. It just makes so much sense. And um, so thank you for that. I'm sure we have questions. And Cynthia, do you want to start off by just, um, you can unmute and ask your question, or I could read it if you prefer. Oh, uh, sure. Thanks. I'll, I'll read it. So uh, first of all, thank you, which I uh, didn't get typed out properly. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I thought this was quite fascinating. I have two questions for you. Uh, I remember hearing a talk by an economist, um, Grantham, I believe, who mm -hmm. talked about the loss of topsoil and how underappreciated that was. And I'm yeah. wondering if there's any, if that relates to any of the things that you're talking about. Um, and then secondly is about methane capture. And I know some people here in California are concerned that these projects to actually pay for methane digestion and biogas capture will actually promote more concentrating feeding organ, um, operations and more livestock that we maybe don't even need and kind of like paying for carbon capture and storage may promote the uh, ongoing uh, oil and gas operations. So if you could comment on uh, both of those, I'd be very interested yeah. and I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your question. Well, yes, topsoil, I mean, soil health is part of One Health, uh, of course. I mean, you can't have healthy plants without healthy soils. Um, so those go together. And of course the microbes in the soil play a very important role in the health of the plants and the health of the planet. It's, it's a very lengthy subject, uh, but I would point you to a really fascinating book called Pharmacology, spelled with an F. Pharmacology by Daphne Miller. Let's see, do I have, I have it on my bookshelf, but I don't remember exactly where I have it. But anyway, uh, Daphne Miller wrote a really great book called Pharmacology that talks about how uh, healthy soils impacts healthy people. You know, our bodies, and I, and I didn't get into the whole microbiome part of it, but um, our, our bodies are mostly microbial. Uh, we are, in a sense, supraorganisms, and uh, our cells communicate with each other through chemicals. And, um, you know, the soils are, work the same way. So uh, we, we need to recognize, you know, we live in a microbial world. Our bodies are microbial. Um, there's so much we don't understand. And, uh, you know, all of that is in its infancy. Now, in terms of your question about California, I have to apologize. I was, before the pandemic, I was just ready to start researching and writing a book on California and how it managed to pass that bill. Um, but then the pandemic started and my efforts got diverted to researching and writing a book about COVID. So I had to shelf that project for COVID um, and uh, so I, I don't really have a good answer for you because I haven't really investigated it. And I'm hoping that in the not too distant future, I, I can get back to that original project that ultimately, I mean, I think climate change is the existential threat we face given its impact on agriculture and food security. Uh, the pandemic is an unfortunate uh, you know, that's not going to end civilization, but it, it, you know, it certainly has killed millions of infected millions and killed millions of people. Um, that's another whole subject, uh, but one, unfortunately, that's taking up pretty much all my time right now. Understandable to say the least, my goodness. Um, we have two more questions here, and I, and, um, I do think that, well, we'll get back to, I think, um, maybe what uh, Cynthia was asking after we hear. Let's start with Floss. And maybe point yeah. out some of the things you put in the chat, which are so excellent too. 
Yeah, so the Bionutrient Association, I've been working with this group and I had them on one of my panel discussions uh, on farm to fork community food systems. They are working to demonstrate the link between the health of the soil microbiome with that of the food coming out of that soil. Mm -hmm. And they have, I'm, I'm putting in <clears throat> the bionutrient meter. They are working on a tool where you can actually in the grocery store, load in a leaf of your salad or whatever product and measure the nutrient density of that product. So the idea of nutrient density uh, links then directly with your gut health. So there, there is a connection between the quality of the soil microbiome, the nutrients that, that come out of the crop raised in that, in that uh, soil and the uh, nutrient density of the food that you're then consuming. And there's also uh, a link that, that uh, has been uh, denied for the longest time, but the chemical loads that you're eating, you know, that you're consuming, uh, particularly glyphosate and so on, uh, is reflected in your microbiome. Uh, so there is now the, the research. Unfortunately, in the US, we don't have the precautionary principle, you know, like in the, in the, in the Europeans have a law that's called the precautionary principle where the burden of proof is on the entity introducing the product into the market and here in the us we have this upside down where you have to prove harm you know and, and by the time you prove harm then you get into endless debates when you think about high fructose corn syrup or you know hydrogenated vegetable oil and so on and so on and, and so the damage done to the population is, is incredible. I mean, there's an assumption that as much as 70% of the health of the US healthcare bill is actually nutrient cost. Right? So there are some, so to, to educate the public on, on these issues would be a really powerful way. And this, this craps you emotionally, right? Because your body, particularly for children, you know, the, the, the brain is, the needs very specific nutrients, micronutrients to evolve normally into a healthy person. And by having a nutrient deficient diet, even in the, even in the formative stages, children have all sorts of problems that, that, are, that are not being linked to the food, but they are really caused by the food. You are what you eat, yeah, I see. absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, this is a really uh, super important topic because I think it will grab the public's attention when you link the, the, their personal health with the health of the soil that this food comes out of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Those are all good points. And I, I wanna point out that glyphosate has been shown to have antibiotic properties and can disrupt your gut microbiome. So yet another reason that you don't wanna have products with that. But that's, that's another whole subject too, extremely important. Um, but, um, and I was going to mention something else besides that. Oh yeah, there's evidence, there's been some evidence that climate change, a hotter planet will make crops less nutritious. Uh, I don't recall the details of that, uh, but that has been uh, mentioned as well. So we have lots of incentives to want to try and get, stay as close to that Holocene baseline as we can to ensure the continuation of agriculture and food security. I think that's such a powerful slide that, you know, that when that, that ice age and the fact that you're only one degree C and all the changes that we saw and that were, were there, yeah. were already there. I, I, I remembered it from the last time I heard it. And when you have a slide that sticks that long in your brain, you know that it's really, it really yeah. packs a punch. So my, my son, who um, just recently defended his, uh, his PhD thesis in glaciology, introduced me to that timeline about five, six years ago. And when I looked at it, my heart stopped because I suddenly understood climate change by looking at that and seeing that Holocene baseline. And it just jumped out at me but yet the climate scientists don't point that out. And yeah. to me, that is the most important thing to understand climate change is the past 10,000 years of agriculture yeah. and the Holocene baseline. But they're, 
you know, I think people would understand that more if that's how it was presented because climate change, change from what? I mean, I never yeah. really understood that until I saw that timeline. Uh, yeah. And that was just, you know, an incredibly powerful visual. So I, I share it in every talk I give because, you know, I think it's really, really important that people yeah. understand what's at stake. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Nicola. Um, I really want to thank you for your talk. Um, it, um, I've been a climate activist, a full-time volunteer for Citizens Climate Lobby for five years. And so I'm always talking to politicians about, you know, climate legislation. I've also organized solar panels for my kids' school, things like that. And I also went vegan about five years ago. And honestly, going vegan was the easiest thing I do in terms of my personal climate impact. And mm -hmm. so your talk was really one of the um, first talks I've seen, of which I've seen many, um, really drawing the uh, connection between, uh, in a very straightforward way, between animal agriculture and climate. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about why more people, politicians, uh, scientists, um, don't jump up and down and just recommend people move towards a more vegan or at least, you know, more of a plant-based diet? I'm not sure. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, you know, diet choice uh, as a, you know, working as a, a clinician many years ago, you know, trying to get people to change behavior is incredibly challenging. Trying to get an entire society to change, given particularly the political divisions that we have. Um, and, and I don't want to get anybody angry or be politically incorrect. But when I do travel to, you know, the Midwest, uh, you know, I, I'm very struck by how uh, so many people are eating animal products three times a day. I mean, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, so, you know, it factors heavily. And, and if you go into grocery stores, you see this huge section on meat and dairy products and, and a tiny little section on, on vegetables and fruits. Uh, you know, it's a real um, kind of a desert, if you will, of, uh, of fruits and vegetables, which I think is a serious problem because if we're asking people to change their diets, we have to provide them with the foods that we want them to eat. Uh, and if that's not really available, and of course, shelf life is short for a lot of these perishables, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It, it really is. Um, yeah, it is. I'm putting a comment in there that is, I'm going to, uh, I'll just say it. As a personal, I'm going to say something very vulnerable to me at the most gut level in the world. And I can tell you as a person who has struggled all of my life with issues of diet that permeate my family from the earliest years, it is extremely difficult. And just like with climate change, the science and the, and the intellect is not enough to overcome the emotion. So it's a very, very complex thing. Having said that, the science does help. And when one sees that chart, it really helps. So thank you. Um, Jean. Oh, thank you so much for your presentation and putting things into such a broad perspective. So first of all, I really, really appreciate hearing that overview and some of the details. Um, I wanna mention that I'm from Missouri and <laughs> there's a lot of the land that is set aside for cattle ranching. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not the biggest state, but we have quite a sizable part of our, um, <laughs> our area that is devoted and it is a very hot topic. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, except Years ago, I decided myself that I didn't want to eat slaughtered meat. <laughs> you know, it just didn't seem like that. And the other thing was that if you eat, you know, a 16 ounce steak, that extra protein is deaminated. It just goes into carbohydrates and fats anyway. And I thought, well, why am I paying all this money for, for excess protein? 
which doesn't do my body any good beyond a certain point. Anyway, that was not my question, but those are a few editorials that I will bring. Uh, my question had to do with the seaweed. And uh, many months ago, I heard about there's a particular strain of uh, seaweed that can be added to the feed of cattle and I'm going to maybe other ruminants too and it really decreases how much methane they burp and yeah. so I don't know how much impact that would have but is that anything that people are picking up on I I've kind of lost oh, yeah. Track. yeah no that's a great question I I know it's a, a subject of uh, active uh, research at UC Davis, for example, they've got people working on that. And um, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because it, it, it appears to be quite effective. The, uh, the, and, and the chemical in the seaweed is called bromoform. And um, I mentioned this to some colleagues at Princeton uh, presented it. And um, one of the climate scientists said that it's bad because uh, bromoform um, adversely affects the ozone in the climate. So you, you know, we don't want to substitute one problem with another. So I'm not sure how much the bromoform in the seaweed is an answer if it jeopardizes our ozone layer too. So that's yeah. all still kind of um, up in the air. That's a fascinating question though. Yeah, it really is. It, it's, it's a really interesting question. Perhaps some other nutrient. Yeah, you know. I, I'm sure there's some sort of feed that we could give them to reduce the methane, but I guess, it, you know, uh, seaweed might be one, but, uh, you know, if they could address the bromoform issue, that would certainly be helpful. And does it matter whether they're grass-fed versus corn-fed? I realize if they're corn-fed, there's intrinsic you know, the nitrogen, the fertilizers, et cetera, to grow the corn. Right. The I, I, unfortunately, I think the grass fed make more methane than the corn. Do they? Oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. There you <laughs> go. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just no easy answer. There's, there's no easy answer to this. <laughs> Taylor? Hi, yes. Um, so thank you. Like everyone said, thank you so much for your talk. I definitely learned a lot. Oh, my um, yeah, uh, I had a question. Um, so I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, while I understand a lot of the points of the talk, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, in my community, there's not really a lot of language around this. Um, people don't really know uh, the, the ties between climate change and you know, what, we, what we eat or what we uh, do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and it's not because we don't want to. Like I think we have, we're keenly, you know, aware of the results. Like I think, um, if folks don't know, this past summer Detroit was mostly underwater due to the intense flooding and poor infrastructure, uh, and people are still dealing with the ramifications of that. So we are we are very aware of you know the effects of all of this, uh, but unfortunately, we're not always aware or in the conversation with you know advocacy language around mitigation language around plant based eating. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering for individuals like myself and my community who don't have a lot of control or not necessarily always in the conversation um, like this, what are some ways that we can advocate? Uh, what is the language that we're missing um, when it comes to something like the One Health Policy? Uh, and it has to sort of be um, a, a bit, I don't know, a bit more nuanced than, you know, changing our diets. We want to be in the conversation, but I also know that, you know, I, I come from an environment that's, that's very low income. I may not necessarily have, not necessarily education, but they don't have the time to kind of be concerned about things. So they got to get to work, right? They're going to feed their kids whatever they can feed them with because uh, yeah, they don't have time to sit down and cook. So what are some language and tools that we can use uh, to sort of put ourselves in this conversation because I think it's so important. And I think those graphics are super important because we're also affected, you know, we're all affected. Um, and yeah, any advice that you would have to that? That's, that's a great question. Well, I, I, you know, I think education, certainly to, uh, you know, your uh, community members, mm -hmm. uh, education to the community leaders, um, political uh, a activism, uh, certainly writing to letters of the letters to the editor in the local newspaper, um, mm -hmm. setting up a One Health uh, uh, organization or club 
Um, that would be awesome because, you know, I've yet to, we've, one of the challenges with the One Health Initiative, it's been largely driven by veterinarians and trying to get this out into the general public has been much, much harder than we thought. And, uh, you know, it seems like an obvious thing, but, but getting it out there has been a real challenge. So we're looking for community activists to help, you know, spread the word. Uh, and uh, boy, if, you know, if, if you can get your community to, to engage, to, you know, meet with your policymakers, to meet with teachers, to, to talk about it, um, that would be a super thing. I know that there's a lot of um, community gardens here in New York, and I know that, and I think there's some community yeah. agriculture going on in Detroit that is certainly a big part of it. If you can, you know, grow your own fruits and vegetables to ensure, uh, you know, a healthy diet. Uh, because your supermarkets are not providing you with the nutrients that you need. I mean, that's a, a really empowering thing. Um, the challenge, of course, is, you know, with, with the climate, um, you know, bad weather can, can hurt that. So if you can get like, you know, greenhouses somehow growing in, in the community, again, you know, it would require raising money and, and all of that. So, I mean, this is a, this is not a quick fix. This is a long-term change in how we, you know, approach our, our, our lives, really. Um, you know, we're dealing with a new normal and it just requires, I think, uh, education, initiative, uh, you know, it, it can be done. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, so, you know, plants are our friends, <laughs> trees, uh, we can't have enough trees. You know, I'm a big supporter of that. So, uh, so all of those things, but promoting agriculture, promoting healthy gardens, you know, to, to your, the kids in school, um, teach them how to garden. You know, those are all really important. Any, you know, not only outdoors, indoor plants are really important for uh, healthy indoor air. Uh, plants will help filter filter the air. So, so there's lots of things to do. Um, you know, we're, we're really at our baseline here. And uh, again, getting the public engaged uh, is, has been our great challenge. So I'm, I'm really grateful to this group for, you know, providing me with the platform to speak, um, you know, because I ordinarily am just talking to other veterinarians. To, I'm, I'm a physician, but again, most of the people interested have been veterinarians. And trying to get this outside that group is has been a real challenge. So, so thank you, and you know, uh, you know, I applaud your efforts. Yeah, Taylor. Taylor is what a second year med student at Wayne State, and oh, she's terrific. also done um, some other work as well. And I think going to take off some time. And Taylor, I'll tell you, if you want to kind of exchange some thoughts, maybe we can come up with something to put in Planet Detroit. And maybe we could run it about by some of these experts to, yeah. you could help us, you know, really frame it and bring it down to real world. And we can, um, you know, try to express some of those concepts. If you have the time or interest, maybe we can look at it. I was going to say, Lisa, face. we have some great, um, a lot of materials that you could put up like in grocery stores and so forth. And so, it, and it looks like Lisa already has your, your email address, but we can send you some some good I'll put it in the chat too, just in case. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, Taylor is our newest. If you could, if you could, you know, kind of recruit your medical student co your colleagues <laughs> to get the docs interest. I mean, because really, it's got to be start with the medical students. Uh, you know, getting it into the medical, it's been virtually impossible. The medical community not interested. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and tearing our hair out, you know, like I said, it's been driven by veterinarians. The docs have not been interested. They're starting to, you know, COVID, COVID had somewhat of an impact, but boy, if you could get some of the physicians on board, that would be a really great thing. So Taylor is our newest member of MICA. And, um, and Steve, Dr. Ashmi was just going to ask a question too, because 
we have been doing work with medical schools and um and and so i don't know if you have the time though it's two minutes before one and do you need to take off then dr uh, i have a few more minutes i have another uh, meeting to join at one so i've got a few more minutes and then uh, I, i'll have to sign off um I, I can you can point. you make it into one sentence steve Real yeah quick. i just uh you mostly addressed it by talking about how hard it is to get doctors and uh, to pay attention to it. And the whole issue with medical school is uh, their curriculum so full, they don't have any room. I think tying it to this work with zoonosis would be very interesting because we're all worried about the next epidemic and obviously climate change and this whole topic directly relates to zoonosis. And I'm excited to sign up for your Coursera. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, uh, like I said, this started out as zoonotic disease. And I'm embarrassed to admit that when I was in medical school, the term zoonosis was never used. I, I only heard about the term when I was doing my policy research at Princeton and some veterinarians sent me their literature. And I go, whoa. You know, there's this overlap between zoonotic diseases, emerging diseases, and bioterrorism, and yet the docs and the veterinarians aren't talking to each other. And it was like, wow, this was a light bulb moment for me. And I published my paper. I got a huge response from the veterinarians, and I heard crickets from the physicians. I mean, there was just no interest whatsoever. So, um, so getting the docs interested is just, you know really uh well, we're we're gonna try that's our mission you. here in michigan we're gonna give it our best shot and Team this presentation was yeah and we actually we do we have um well we we have a vet in our group and she's awesome though so yeah. um listen thank you so very very much Pleasure. for your time i want to let you go and thanks to everybody who was on the call i really appreciate that um, if people want to stay on, Dr. Khan, you go ahead and go. I know you've got something on one and those who can stay. Thanks so much for being here.